About four or five months ago, we had a very small baby. He's still a baby now, but he was smaller then. And when that's going on, there's a lot of demands on time and, and holding and what have you, and so the other kids have to fend for themselves sometimes. And so they found themselves jumping on the trampoline, and Elia got herself out there with the big boys. Elia is only two, the boys are nine and six, and she landed wrong jumping and started complaining about her leg. We tried to get her to walk. She wouldn't put weight on it. We thought, we've got to go to the doctor. She goes and gets checked out. Uh, the x-ray shows no break. The doctor says she has what's called a toddler break. Some of y'all may be uh, you know, medical professionals. You can talk to me afterwards about whether this is a bit like when you go camping and someone wants to go on a snipe hunt. <laughs> it doesn't show up in the, on the screen, but it's there. Um, and so she gets a cast. I, I don't know if it's an orthopedics way to you know, send kids to school because everybody's got to do it. I understand. Uh, but she got a cast all the way up almost to her hip. It was uh, in, a, uh, in her foot. She had like a sock of it that was also the cast pink from toe to hip. And she loved it. <laughs> it was hard as casts can be. She has two big brothers and now she was weaponized. Oh, she laid into them several times with her new weapon on her leg. She learned to walk on it pretty quickly. She hobbled around, but she only had to wear it for a few weeks. And so the day came, we'd watch some videos for Pepper, prepare her for the removal. She did fine for that, but the moment came to stand her up and have her uh, walk on her newly healed leg, and she sat down and basically stayed seated for several weeks, wanting to be carried everywhere. Didn't want to believe that she could walk. We'd say, your, your leg's healed. You can walk on it now. No, broke my leg. And when you have a small baby and your other larger baby wants to be held, there's lots of fun to be had. And Holly and I started talking, well, I guess we could carry her like this to her dorm room. When she goes off to school, I will tell you that it took weeks, but eventually she started to trust her leg and walk. Got me thinking about our scripture that we have been encountering in John's gospel of healing narratives and how the role of trust and belief plays in our response to healing both then and now. We've been talking about uh, Jesus going to weddings in Cana of Galilee and in his abundance overflowing love and joy turning water into wine and helping out a friend for his mother. Last week we talked about uh, John 4 where there's this strange healing where Jesus doesn't seem to want to do it and he's concerned that in so doing faith will be improperly directed at the miracle rather than the message and the Messiah. We talked about not being called to worship uh, the show or the signs but instead what the signs point to. And so the healing of that uh, Officer's son uh, happens, and then we find ourselves being told in 5 1 there's another festival in Jerusalem. John wants you to know that there's lots of parties going on in Jer uh, Jerusalem. There is. At the heart and hope of the people of God is a spirit of celebration. Verse 2 is where we pick up our scripture. Now in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, um, this is, there's several gates that you can still visit now. These would be different gates because the walls were knocked down a few times between now and then. Uh, but there are gates, they carry the same names. Um, and so there are gates in the city of Jerusalem. They would have different ways to talk about them, just like people talk about roads uh, and bridges today. The Sheep Gate, there is a pool, that's water, called in Hebrew, Bethsaida, which has five porticos. In these lay many invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. If I have a cold for three days, that third day, okay, all of it, the whole thing's horrible for people around me, but that third day I'm ready to do whatever it is to get away from that. Some of you know some of the times when an illness is serious, the long journey, the grind, even of the healing process, 38 years this man came to the pool and the story was we believe that this pool which you can still go visit they've uh, uh, dug it up you can go visit the pool that we're talking about here ha had uh, bubbles that would rise from now and then some people thought an angel stirred it up other folks thought it was some sort of spirit from the underworld whatever the pagan myths about it might be but it would bubble up and the first person that would get in the waters once the bubbles would be stirred that person would be healed so folks would gather and wait and watch for that sign of the power to be there, and they would go 
to be the first person that gets in the water. 38 years this man has come and sat by the pool. When Jesus saw him lying there, and he knew he'd been there for a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? What a question. 38 years. Do you want to be made well? I think Jesus is actually showing some kindness here. It seems perhaps harsh to ask someone who's been incapacitated, limited, ill for almost four decades, do you want to be made well? We want to say, well, absolutely, but here's the thing. He's made his life work, hasn't he? 38 years. He's in his 50s at this point at least. He's figured out how to make his life work as this guy. This is who he is. This is his story. And there's a little bit of a challenge. Maybe he isn't trying so hard to get in. uh, We don't know that for sure. Jesus says, do you want to be made well? And I think the warning is, maybe it's for us too, if you're made well, things change. If you're made well, things change. Your life changes. Your story changes. Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up, and when I'm making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. I've got no people. Yes, I do want to be made well, but I've got no one that will help me get to the place where that healing might take place. I've got no one to do what we hear in a different healing story of Jesus. Remember that one where they tear the roof off a building that Jesus is in to lower their friend down to get healed by Jesus? He's got people that are invested in his healing. This guy's got no one. Sir, I've got no one to heal me, to bring me to the pool, and somebody beats me every time I try. Jesus said to him, stand up, take your mat, and walk. At once the man was made well. He took up his mat and began to walk. Can you imagine the first moment where he stood up and had to believe his legs were going to work after all that time. The word in Greek, stand up, is uh, the word very much like be resurrected. The word that roots in resurrection, where John is pointing all of these signs to come, that Jesus is the one that brings heaven to earth, the true temple among God's people, the word of God made flesh, the light that the darkness can't defeat, the hope that can't be killed. This is the resurrected hope for John, and he's pointing all of these miracle stories for us to see this. Stand up, take up your mat, and walk. See, already, once he said he wanted to be made well, Jesus put him to work. He'll do the same thing to you. If you say, yes, Jesus, I, I, I want that healing for my legs or my heart or my hope or my children or my family. I, I want that restoration in my life. I want that resurrection hope in my heart. He's going to say, get up and go. There is work to be done and things for you to do. Now we hit a issue. That day was a Sabbath. Sabbath was a day reserved not to take up your mat and get to work. So the Jews said to the man who'd been cured, it's the Sabbath, it's not lawful for you to carry your mat. Notice what they're concerned with. 38 years, going nowhere, and suddenly on the wrong day, he's carrying some bedding. But he answered him, the man who made me well said to me, take up your mat and walk. And so they asked him, this is amazing, let's get this healing for all people. We know lots of broken folks, let's get this this power. Nope. They asked him, who is this man who said to you, take up your mat and walk? Now the man who'd been healed didn't know who it was, for Jesus had disappeared into the crowd that was there. Are you seeing the theme in these miracle stories? Jesus doesn't stick around for the applause, right? He doesn't stand there kind of kindly while the doxology is sung on the back end of an amazing performance. He slips into a crowd, or he keeps on his way, or he tells folks don't say anything, or he hides it from them because he fears they won't yet understand what it's pointing to. He hides away. It's not the healing. It's what the healing makes possible that's most important. Take up your mat and walk because now he can follow. Our world all the time uh, is filled with people who will tell you to follow your heart. We've talked about this. The problem with that is our hearts are broken compasses. 
People follow their hearts all over this world to pain, frustration, and damage to themselves and others. Every movie, every song says you'll find your freedom when you follow your heart. You'll get more lost if you follow a broken instrument and our hearts are. Our hearts must be remade in the image of the one who created them, healed and made whole, and then told to take up your mat or your heart and walk. And then we know we can go in the right direction. There's another group of people in the world who don't tell you to follow the heart, and they're represented well in this story and all throughout the New Testament. They say, don't follow your heart, follow the rules. If everybody would just follow the rules, then everything would be okay, be orderly and proper. We'd know what was going on. It'd be righteous, good. But Jesus doesn't say, follow your heart. He doesn't say, follow the rules. He says, follow me. So do you want to be made well? Because Jesus is going to say, take up your mat and come this way. Later, Jesus found that man in the temple and said to him, See, you've been made well. He's excited about it. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. There's worse things than being sick. The man who went away and told the Jews it was Jesus who made him well. Therefore, the Jews started persecuting Jesus because he was doing such things on the Sabbath. Here ends the reading. The word of God for the people of God. Such things such terrible, terrible things, like bringing healing and restoration to a man for 38 years who ached for it and had no people. 38 years he waited for someone to help him to the pool, and Jesus said, this pool, if it does anything, is just a shadow, just an echo of the thing that God can do in his power and his presence in Jesus, that word made flesh, take up your mat and follow me. And so they start to persecute Jesus. Later in the text it says they start to try to kill him. They plot his death. For what? Doing things so powerful that the rules they hold precious no longer hold sway on the hearts of those they seek to control. Such things, such amazing things Jesus did healing on the Sabbath. I wonder, I don't think maybe it's only two-year-olds who don't trust that healing can take place, whether that's physical or spiritual or emotional or relational healing. No, we think we're defined by the brokenness and pain we have known, the wounds the world has inflicted upon us, that the world has placed in our obstacles and our path, the, the story of our origins, the families we come from, that's who we are. We're the broken people. Sorry, we say, like Elia, I'm broken. Jesus says, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made well? Now, if you are, if you get relational healing with your family, you're, you're going to have to see them at Thanksgiving and Christmas. You've been warned. If you get relational healing in your marriage, you're going to show up in a new way. Do you want to be made well? If you want relational healing with your children or if you want healing in your emotional life, then God's going to open up that healed heart to love somebody that's going to be hard to love. Everywhere, always, each time in Scripture, when God pours out a miracle or a blessing, it's so that somebody else can be blessed. Every time. Now, I I have the same channels on my TV that you have, and so I've seen folks who dress a bit like this, stand in places that look something like this, and tell you God wants to bless you because you're just so cute. And particularly cute if you send me a little money. I don't mean me personally, although you're welcome to give to the church. But they connect that to the blessing. Right? Because you're so uh, great, God wants to love you the best, you're going to get all the special treats, and so that blessing is an inventory of grace that we keep and hoard. That is never what Scripture invites us to do. Every time people have a gift, every time they have a blessing in Scripture, every time that I see it in the text, it invites them to respond to that as a part of the message that's breaking into the world. Every blessing comes with responsibility. And this is important for us. Because we are people who have been richly and deeply blessed, are we not? We have been told to take up our mat and walk. But some of us, and I'm tempted too to say sometimes, I have parts of my story I want to keep to myself because I get that life for 38 years. For 38 years, I've kept parts that I wouldn't let God heal. Those parts I kept to myself because I get that. I get to control that and I trust those things. And God still says to me and says to us, says to you in the scripture, do you want to be made well? If you are, if you do, I can, but it will change everything. Often when I'm reading stories like this, I think, I wish John's gospel had an epilogue. 
that picked up with different characters. I want to hear about the, I want to meet the couple that got married in Canaan of Galilee. I'd like to hear their story later on about like how, you know, their family they raised and everything else and how great the wine was that Jesus made. I, I want to listen to stories of, of this uh, father in Capernaum and the child, the man that boy came up to be and the blessing that he shared with the world. We don't get all those stories. We're told certain things so that we would know that Jesus is the Messiah and the hope of the world. And here I want to find out what happens to this guy who took up his mat. What was his life like for those last decades of his journey? What did he do? What did he think as he told this story and gave witness? We don't have him with us today. We do have Samuel Orlando here. Somebody else who said they did want to be made well, and there were friends and people around him willing to step in and help him to that healing. The person in the story that we just read waits for 38 years because he has no people to bring him to the blessing until Jesus shows up. I want you to make Samuel Orlando welcome. I want him to share his story with you all so you can hear about a life changed and the testimony he has because of that. Samuel, why don't you come on up here, bud? All right, Sammy, we saw the video. We heard you talk a little bit about your story, but we are glad that you're here. Bless you. Thank you. They treat you okay over there at 930? It was, it was amazing. Okay. Yes. He's running back and forth. He's with us at 815. He did the contemporary service, and he ran across the bridge. Did you run, or did I'm you? I'm already losing weight, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, and so the, we have uh, some notion of uh, the fact that there are people who uh, are, we, we kind of put in this category of poverty, but I don't know that we always have an appreciation for what that really looks like. This is part of your story, so before you were connected to Compassion, before any of this happened in your life, can you share with them a little bit about who you were and what that meant uh, for your growing up years? Yes, well, thank you again for having us right here. It's amazing. I was born in a the, the small town of the Dominican Republic, Luperon, and uh, my dad, who was only 25 years old, passed away. He was a pastor over there. Uh, he only had two years of ministry, two years of marriage, and I was six months when he passed away. And not having my dad present in my life uh, basically put my mother and I in a situation of living in extreme poverty. And I, I go to churches here in the U.S. And, and share my story, and I try to explain what poverty means. And it's kind of like a little difficult because uh, he, in the U.S., sometimes we think being poor means that you don't own a house. You know, sometimes poverty means uh, that you make the minimum wage. Or for my son, poverty means you don't own an iPhone, you're poor. And just recently he told me, yeah, we're poor because I don't own a spinner. I'm like, no, that's not poverty. Um, for my mother and I, poverty meant that we didn't know if we are going to have breakfast, lunch, or dinner today we're not even thinking about when we retire or the next month today are we gonna have lunch that was poverty to us poverty to me meant that at the age, at the age of five I had to go to the streets and sell cornbread so basically my mom used to wash the neighbor's clothes by hand and then with the money she would buy corn and make cornbread and I would sell it and I remember while I was selling cornbread the kids were playing and it was kind of hard because I wanted to play what I couldn't and I remember one of, one of the girls always would come to me and tell me, you're just a cornbread seller, you're good for nothing. So poverty was not only just that lack of financial, but the lack of a father that I was needing, the lack of the love, the lack of care, the lack of faith, the lack of hope. That was poverty in my life. And in many occasions, uh, the physical needs were, you know, lack of physical needs were there. Um, one time my mom and I wouldn't have anything to eat and... We were praying, God, can you please provide something for us today? And that day, God used somebody to bless us. And this person brought 10 plantains, those are green bananas in the Dominican Republic, and two eggs. And Pastor, I was literally jumping, saying, God, just provided for us. That's this amazing. But then my mom started dividing those plantains. She said, this two for Sister Mary, this two for Sister Luz, and I started to worry. I said, Mom, you're giving away our blessing. What's going on? And then she said, Samuel, it is better to give than to receive. And then after that, I started to say that God always provides. People come to me and they tell me, if God always provides, why were you living in extreme poverty? If God always provides, why right now we have 400 million children living in extreme poverty? Kids dying out of malnutrition, preventative causes. Why if God always provides? And I tell them, God always provides. The problem is that we are not always willing 
to share what God provides. So we don't have a lack of financials and you know, resources in the world. We have a lack of sharing. I was going to school with broken shoes, sometimes empty stomach, barely any school supplies. I had no hope. My life before compassion was that, living in extreme poverty. So uh, you are uh, an alum, I don't know what the word, what word do you use? You're an alumnus an of, the, of the program? Okay, yeah. alumni. And so you were a, a sponsored child. If you don't know Compassion, it's a sponsorship program worked through uh, local churches in community with local leadership. And so you got sponsored, and then what effect that had on your story and your life at that point? It was amazing because when you go through a tough life like, like we did over there, you feel like God aband had abandoned you, and, and God never abandons his children. And he used a person to bless my life. Her name is Terry from Canada. She was a sponsor. So I would imagine that Terry went to church. And then after the church, she went to the, to the booth and at the table saw my picture. Probably freaking out because, you know, first time I was taking a picture. And she saw my picture. And out of all these kids, she chose me. And she said, I want to demonstrate God's love by sponsoring Samuel, by rescuing him from poverty and she did this through this ministry compassion international and if you haven't heard of compassion this is a true christ-centered ministry that releases children from poverty in jesus name i tell you this financials or 38 dollars a month which is what it costs to sponsor a child does not change a life but jesus does jesus does and jesus uses people like you to be instrumental and change people like me living in extreme poverty. So Terry sponsored me, and she wrote letters to me. More than anything else, what really changed my life was the letters that I received of Terry telling me that I could become whoever I wanted to be. Terry told me that, I, that even if I don't have a biological father alive, that I have an eternal father, and that I could become a blessing to others. I could not believe God could use a comrade seller to be a blessing. Not just be released from poverty, but become a blessing. So I receive all the meals, the school supplies, the uniforms, the health care, and the best of all, my local church empowering me and sharing the masses of Jesus. Compassion believes the hope is through the local church in those 25 different countries. They know the need of their communities. So we let them be the leaders and look for those children and, and bless those kids. You know, you will probably in the future be able to go to a visit a compassion program. And something you will notice is that there's no compassion sign over there. It doesn't say compassion. It only says the name of the church because you want the local church to empower and to bless the community. And I receive all these benefits. And because of that, I am today a recording engineer, a musician, and a singer, and I preach the gospel around the world because that was my dream. Now I can sponsor two children. Not only that, my God, God allowed me to have my own ministry where I can go back and preach the gospel through music, and not only that, bring over a thousand backpacks with school supplies for the kids to bless them. I can only give God the glory because God used somebody like you to change somebody like me. So you went through there, uh, but you sponsor two children now. I think it said in the video, right? Yes, yeah. and I am an advocate for compassion, so I can now get to share and speak for those that have, you know, that don't have uh, anything. Right, so you got folks sitting here that have maybe heard about uh, compassion before, and they're hearing uh, a word, hopefully, from God from the Scripture today. Uh, what would you say to them as a way that they could participate? We're talking about a guy who was sitting by the water and didn't have anybody to help. If there's somebody here saying, you know, if I knew how, I would do something, what would you say to them? I would like to encourage you to, today not to sponsor a child if you feel guilty about it. Because we shouldn't just react out of guilt or if we feel sorry. We should respond out of conviction. We should respond out of thinking, I want to be used by God. I want to be Jesus' hands and feet. I want to bring healing to those children. And I want to tell you this, Pastor, I, a very short story. I went back to the ER one time where I still see kids trying to find food in dumpsters. I go to Haiti where, where I see nine-year-old little girls prostituting themselves to get clean water after the earthquake. And in DR, a friend of ours came to our house and she forgot her backpack in my house. And I felt to put $20 in there without her knowing, but I wasn't sure. And I've been in church for a long time, so I gotta be honest with you. And I said, let me just pray about it. And being honest, pastor, I use that phrase to do nothing. 
So I say, yeah, I'll pray about it, but I don't do anything. They've never done that before. No, no, right. probably not. Yeah. I'm a, I really, yeah. <laughs> but um, I did that. And the next day, this girl, 23-year-old girl, single mother, three kids, still trying to make it through high school, she told me, yesterday I was being kicked out of the house because I didn't have 500 Dominican pesos, which equals to $20. And she told me, somebody gave me the money out of the blue. And then I, I felt very happy for her, but at the same time, I felt very sad inside of me because I knew God wanted to use Samuel Orlando to be a blessing, and he had to use somebody else. And after that, I said, God, whenever you show me a need, I'm not going to think about it or pray about it. I'm going to act about it. Today, you may be thinking, man, I, would, I, would, I want to do something at church. I want to be involved. This is a great opportunity for you to become a missionary without leaving this place. A dollar 25 cents a day, which is like a Coke, not even a Starbucks coffee. <laughs> with that, you could actually start something in your relationship with a child a child like you, you could actually meet, write letters back and forth, and you could become one of the people that God is using in this generation to change lives in Jesus' name. So thank you very much for doing that today. I want to pray for Samuel and for us, uh, but I know you'll make him feel welcome. I think in between services, you might have a chance to grab him, but there's certainly folks at the table that can answer any questions you might have. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for Samuel, uh, for your work in his life, uh, for the deep and meaningful, redemptive uh, work that you've done in his heart and his story. We thank you for Terry in Canada. We thank you for all those like her and like Samuel, who become those people who, through your grace and the power of Jesus, bring blessing to the world that it might be more like you and end, where children are no longer in harm's way, no longer hurting, no longer lacking in hope, but instead filled with the possibility of your kingdom made real in their hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Samuel. Bless you, buddy. Will you thank him for his time and his story? So he said something I want to make sure you hear. Uh, don't do a thing. We say this all the time at the offering here. We, we believe that Scripture calls us to be generous. It doesn't call us uh, to guilt trips of generosity. Uh, I want to invite you to separate uh, blame and guilt. Remember our Scripture today. Who was really concerned about blame and guilt? Who was it that did this to you? Who told you to carry this mat? Those who were opposed to the hope of Jesus. The cross is a story about God's love for the world. And it's about how we trade guilt and shame and blame for grace and responsibility. We lay down our control, we lay down uh, our maybe uh, idolatry of the rules, we lay down shame and blame, who's to blame? And let me tell you, friends, we live in a world in which this is going on over and over again. I don't think you're to blame for the fact that 400 million children live in extreme poverty. I think it's less than a dollar a day, or at least less than two dollars a day uh, by uh, global definitions. I don't think it's your fault. So we're not to blame here at university for the fact that the foster care system in Texas is struggling to meet the needs and demands of children who have been left out, unloved, and abused and neglected. I don't, I don't think you're to blame for that. I don't think I'm to blame for the fact that this is going on in our world. I don't think you're to blame for the fact that this world is increasingly divided, angry, and polarized that differences between people are becoming harder to navigate because we've become more and more tribal in our understanding of our politics, racially, economically. I don't think it's our fault or we're to blame for that. I think we come to the cross and we lay down blame, we lay down uh, shame, we lay down guilt, and instead we pick up God's grace, and then we ask who can respond. This, kid, this guy standing by the water who was looking for healing wasn't looking whose fault it is that he's ill. He was thinking, who can respond and help me bring grace and healing to my life? So don't sponsor a kid for shame or guilt. But if you believe you have the grace of God and are so blessed to be a part of that, can be a part of what's happening in Compassion and want to do that, we've asked them to bring uh, children to sponsor from, from places this church has invested. Guatemala. Mexico, and I tried to get, I don't know if Linda Hearn is in this service or a different, but I tried to get Senegal. 
they don't have Senegal, but they have Ghana. That's as close as I could get. So we have Ghana uh, as options here. And then they have a list of kids who have been the longest waiting from all over the world for sponsorship. So go by the table, pray with your family. I can tell you that uh, we sponsor two kids from Kenya because that's where our uh, sort of connection was going internationally. They're the same ages as our sons, uh, Cannon and Beckett. And we have, uh, we're excited to get two more kids that will be sponsored in and through this program for Elia and for Judah, our two youngest. So we'd have them at the same age of our kids. You get letters back as they go through school. You watch them in pictures get older, and you see as God goes to work in their hearts. Um, I pray that whether it's this or somewhere else, you believe that you're called to lean against the darkness and bring light, that you would want to be made well. And friends, for many of us, the way we get made well is being a part of the blessing of those who are deeply in need of healing. God so wants to pour out provision upon them, and he can do it through us, then we get made well to. Um, let's pray. Lord, thank you for uh, the word you have given us through John's gospel, through Samuel's testimony and presence. May we be people who say yes to Jesus when he asks us whether we want to be made well, even if it changes our life. If laying down shame and guilt and sin frees us to be grace-filled, responding people in your kingdom, Lord, it can be scary, it can be uncertain, it can be mysterious, but it's with you and we want to go. So for this church and for each individual and the families here gathered, pour out your spirit in abundance that we would face the future unafraid and pick up our mats and get to work. All honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, for it's in your name we pray. Amen.